Hello again, it's Mr. Strickland, part three, Marvin of the Great North Woods. All right, so far, Marvin's left his family, gone off to a logging camp, and it seems like he has somewhat made friends with John Louis. Every day, Marvin worked until midday when he went into the cookhouse and ate baked beans and two kinds of pie with Mr. Murray and the cook. After lunch, he returned to his office and worked until the Jacks returned from the forest for supper. By Friday of the second week, Marvin had learned his job so well that he finished early. He had not been on his skis since he had arrived at camp. Every day the routine was simple meals and work, and Marvin kept his office and away from the lumberjacks as much as he could. But today he wanted to explore, so he put on his skis and followed the sled paths into the woods. He glided forward, his skis making soft, wishing sounds in the snow. This certainly was different from skiing in Duluth, where he would dodge the ragman's cart or the milkman's wagon, where the sky was not notched with chimney pots belching smoke, where the, sky, where the snow turned sooty as soon as it fell. Here in the great north woods, all was still and white. Beads of ice glistened on bare branches like jewels. The frosted needles of pine and spruce prickled the eggshell sky, and the ghostly moon began to climb over the treetops. <clears throat> Marvin came upon a frozen lake covered with snow, which lay in a circle of tall trees like a bowl of sugar. He uh, skimmed out across it on his skis, his cheeks stinging in the cold air, and stopped in the middle to listen to the quietness. And then Marvin heard a deep, low growl. At the edge of the lake, a shower of snow fell from a pine. A grizzly bear? Marvin gripped his ski poles. A grizzly awake in the winter? What would he do if a bear came after him? Where could he hide? Could he outski a grizzly? Marvin began to tremble, but he knew that he must remain still, very still. Maybe, Marvin thought desperately, the grizzly would think he was a small tree growing in the middle of the lake. He tried very hard to look like a tree. But concentrating on being a tree was difficult because Marvin kept thinking of the bundle on the train platform, his mother, his father, his two big sisters, his two little sisters. He began, he longed, um, let's see, he belonged in Duluth with them, not in the middle of a great north woods with a grizzly. The hot tears streamed down his cheeks, turned cold, then froze. When another tree shower, uh, showered snow, Marvin startled, shot out across the lake. As he reached the shore, a huge shadow slid from behind the trees. The breath froze in Marvin's throat. In the thick purple shadows, he saw a blue twinkle. Ah, Marvin, Jean-Louis held a glistening axe in one hand. He looked taller than ever. Um, I marked the trees for cutting next season. He stepped closer to the trunk and swung the axe hard. Snow showered at Marvin's feet. Ah, mon petit, you cry? Jean-Louis took off his glove and rubbed his huge thumb down Marvin's cheek. You miss your mama, your papa? Marvin nodded silently. John Louis, he whispered. The huge lumberjack bent closer. I thought you were a grizzly bear. You what? John Louis gasped. You think I was a grizzly? And John Louis began to laugh. And as he roared, more snow fell from the tree, for his laugh was as powerful as his axe. As they made their way back to the sled pass, Marvin heard a French song drifting through the woods. The other jacks came down the path, their saws and axes slung across their shoulders, 
and Marvin and John Louise joined them. Evening shadows fell through the trees, and as Marvin skied alongside the huge men, he hummed the tune they were singing. One day followed next. Every morning in that time when the night had worn thin, but the day had not yet dawned, Marvin shouted, Up, Letovi, Let to John Louise. Together, they would go to the dining hall, where one day Marvin would eat steak and oatmeal without milk, the next day he would eat oatmeal with milk and flapjacks, but no meat, but no steak. John Louise always ate the bacon and anything else Marvin left. And every afternoon after that, Marvin would finish his work well before sunset and ski into the woods. Although the worry that his family might catch the terrible sickness nagged at him constantly, when he was in the woods, his fear grew dim in the silence and shadows of the wintry forest. And every day he would fall in beside John Louis and as the Jacks returned to camp, and he would hum the French songs that Jean Louis told him were about a beautiful woman in the far, far north, or a lonely bear in its den, or a lovely maiden named Go With Clouds. That night, after supper was done, Marvin learned the lumberjack songs and how to play their games, the ones he could manage, like axe throwing. A jack would heave an axe from 30 paces at the tail end of a log. For Marvin, they moved the mark up to 10 feet. The jacks challenged each other to barrel lifting and bucksaw contests, but Marvin was too small for those. He was not, however, too small to dance. Sometimes he danced on the floor, and sometimes John Louis lifted him, and Marvin did a little two-step right there in his stocking feet on the shoulders of the big lumberjack. In April, Four months after Marvin had arrived in the camp, the snow began to melt. Mr. Murray said to Marvin, I promised your parents I'd send you back while there was still enough snow for you to ski on. Every day it grows warmer. You better go before you have to swim out of here. I'll send your parents a letter to, um, to say you're coming home, but I don't know what I'll do for a bookkeeper. So it was planned that Marvin would leave on the last day of the month. When the day came, he went to the bunkhouse to find Jean Louise. Ah, Marvin! Jean Louise tasted Marvin's name as he had the first time he had ever said it, as if it were the most delicious French pastry in the world. I have something for you, mon petit. He got up and opened the chest at the end of his bed. You are a woodsman now, he said, and handed Marvin a brand new axe. The head was sharp and glinting, and the handle glistened like dark honey. Merci, 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 Jean Louis, merci beaucoup, Marvin whispered. Okay, so that is the end of part three. So we'll be back again with the exciting conclusion.